Um, hi, everybody, to my talk, Anti-Fragile Cloud Architectures. Uh, my name is uh, Agim. I'm from the company Mimacom. I have some relation to cloud architectures because I work on framework development and application development in the last years. And today in my talk, I want to introduce what basically are the consequences of working on a distributed architecture, how to make that architecture robust, and uh, after making that robust, how to make it anti-fragile. Anti-fragile is a term coined by a book which is not IT related, um, which is um, a book about anti-fragility in the world, and it is applicable, applicable to everything. Um, when I started with cloud architectures, I came from the server computing part. Server computing part basically means you have hardware and that hardware runs and you don't anticipate failure. If you go to the cloud computing space, um, something will change. There will be a lot of nice things on the cloud computing space. Um, the best thing is obviously it just gets very cheap what you can do. So hardware costs are down 30% each year. So you can have more and more boxes. You can make bigger and bigger architectures. When I talk about cloud, I'm not assuming you're using Amazon. You can also use your private cloud. So that basically only means you add more hardware, you distribute your application, and you are not running on a monolith application. Um, this is basically the way where microservice-based applications um, have their advantages because you can scale them in different level. As you can see here in this cube, um, you can scale applications um, by duplication. This is also doable with the monolith, but you can also modularize it. And starting with modularization, you have a lot of advantages because you can scale up different components in your application, but you have also disadvantages, and this is what the talk is about. So about basically the chances scaling up from one single server by duplicating um, to two servers, but the next step is to modularize your application to have many small fine-grained services that talk to each other. These services can then basically be scaled up or scaled down on the need, and uh, then you can better react on the workload. So not just a big duplication, but you can really, on the micro level, you can scale up the apps. The third level is partitioning, obviously. You can install your application on more than one data center. The main advantages from the architecture perspective is that you can basically scale up and scale down your applications. So as we see here, utilization is, um, on the white line, we can see that this is basically a demand which you can add by just adding a new big server. Um, on the small fine-grained line, we can see that you can add services or remove services to cover your demand. So an architectural approach here is to have a, you name it, service. A few companies, call it microservice. Actually, the biggest inventors of that, Amazon and Netflix, they just call it services. They say we have a service-oriented architecture where we split everything into services, and they don't argue about the size. So they just say we have services. And this is an architectural approach, obviously, I think everybody is aware of. Um, when you start to build those applications, what I did a few years ago already, you're likely running to get some book, domain-driven design that explains you how to split an application into different services. Um, domain-driven design talks about bounded context, so that basically means you split up your domain into small parts, and those small parts can independently be deployed, they can be scaled up, they can be scaled down, they can be updated, obviously. So if you take a domain, you will likely have some kind of modularization into different bounded contexts in your application. And those bounded contexts are self-contained services. So um, here we can see you have four services as an example, and those bounded contexts will work in some relation. They can be partners in the terms of domain-driven design. Um, they can be conformists, so they really work closely together. Um, uh, or uh, they can be a shared kernel. So it doesn't mean that every module in your application must be a service. It just means a bounded context should itself be a service. So if you start to build this kind of architectures, the big advantage is you can do quite a good modularization. Um, you can do a good dependency tree of your models, of your services. But at some point, you end up with this kind of service network. And this is where the talk is about how to handle the complexity 
or the issues that are imposed by using this kind of architecture. Um, if you look at this picture, you have probably already seen that. This is the service network or part of that of Netflix. Um, they run more than 700 microservices itself, uh, more than 10,000 Amazon instances um, during the day. You're probably not going to rebuild Netflix, uh, obviously, but even with a small application, if you start to build the application, you start hacking and you end up with something like this. This because microservices have one big disadvantage. <clears throat> By nature, they are distributed, and distributed systems have one big disadvantage, which Werner Vogel says, the CTO of Amazon, everything fails all the time. So if you run on a monolithic application, you will likely not hit any of the problems that you will have with networking. And this problem is, the, the IT industry is aware since a long, long time that network is hard, um, but the problem is that with microservices, this is dramatically increased. Um, These points here are basically wrong points. Um, they are proven by the network fallacies. Uh, the network is reliable, it's not. So even if you are in the same data center, the network is never reliable because it can fail. There is some cable in between, that cable can be unplugged, a switch can fail, a router can fail, everything can fail in between. Latency is zero. You will have uh, performance problems if you have too much of hops in your application. Um, so you have to take care that the latency does not increase that much. Bandwidth is infinite. Even with the biggest bandwidth, you are still Fin you still are con constrained by the network. So this has been already introduced since a long time by the network fallacies. It's already published 94 that talks about that network is hard, to put it simple. And starting with your architectures, if you start with the distributed architectures, the first problem that you're going to have is basically timeouts. So timeouts can happen everywhere. They will likely not happen in a monolithic application if you don't have any interface to talk to. So if you are really, really self-contained application without any external interface, you will probably not hit a timeout. But as soon as you start to work with external services, especially with the microservices, you are likely going to hit timeouts. There are a lot of examples in the Java space. Uh, one example is JMS, obviously. So if you pull messages, um, you can do a receive on a queue. And if the network fails, this happens, for instance, on WebSphere, MQ, and other messaging providers, in between, it might be that the consumer never comes back. So basically, this receive call is stuck the whole time, even though it will never receive anything because the connection below has been physically closed already, but the consumer does not know that this happened. So a good thing about timeouts or when working with external systems is every time to use actually timeouts. Most of the APIs, they provide possibilities um, to set timeouts. So one thing is uh, on a message consumer, while consuming or receiving, you can just set the timeout. Um, the other example is HTTP, and uh, I will run a pretty comprehensive demo on that. Is basically if you use the HTTP client to connect to somewhere, um, the default of the JVM just does not provide any timeout. So if you run into a timeout or if the server does not respond, you are likely going to kill the server. And this is what I'm uh, going to show in a demo right now. Um, so on the HTTP side, it's very convenient, or by the APIs, it's very convenient to set the timeouts either through the API or through default properties so that your application will return pretty fast. Um, the same can happen on the data source. Um, actually. So on the data source, if you don't set the max weight um, and your database is exhausted or the database pool to be more specific, you are very likely running into a situation where the server does not respond at all. So this is what I want to show a bit how to uh, or what can go wrong with uh, working without timeouts and with timeouts. So. Um, I have an application here which uh, basically calls another application. So this is the more uh, interesting part. So this is a REST template used with Spring, uh, but it doesn't matter because it uses the standard Java API below. I have another service uh, which is actually called, and this uh, service has some kind of thread sleep. So the service is slow. So I can start this service with a parameter. And if I run now the, the, my price calculator, this is the service who calls the slow service. 
Um, I have the problem that one call takes quite a lot of time. Um, so uh, because I have a delay of uh, two minutes in that. So you see I have waiting here. So if I look in my thread, I have a profiler here, which is not uh, very interesting, but we can see the threads. Currently, I see I have a lot of free, uh, uh, free threads. So if I use a tool, there is, for instance, Apache Bench, and this tool will um, execute quite a lot of requests. And the default behavior, what happens is, basically, if I execute too many threads, the HTTP clients are waiting. Um, you can see that my server is uh, suddenly consumed totally. So all my threads, what we can see here, are now blocked. And the downside of this is, if you call an external service, and that external service is only one use case in your application, and you have 100 other use cases, they are also going to fail because the problem is the threat pool is full. So even another URL which I'm calling, which does not have anything to do with uh, external service, this is only a status page which should come up, uh, my server is essentially dead. So uh, he does not accept any other connections anymore. And this is what happens very often if you start consuming external REST services. Um, for now, I can only kill my server, actually, or I can wait the two or three minutes until everything comes back. So I'm going to kill it, obviously, because I plan to do a bit of more things today. So uh, what can people basically do to fix that? I mean, the most uh, obvious thing is what I talked uh, already is basically to set a timeout. In the REST template, there is a, um, a way where you can basically use a better, um, a better transport API, the HTTP client. And on this HTTP client, I can set a timeout. So to, let's say, 500 milliseconds. Now I can restart my application again. So now this page works. I can just filter the threads. And now I can execute some load with my tool. The tool, by the way, is Apache Bench. So if you want to load test your stuff very easy on the command line, you can just use it. You just give how many threads you are using and what you are doing. And now we see a pattern here, basically, on the timeout that the threads are blocked, obviously, but only for a very certain amount of time, so the 500 milliseconds. So that basically means my, even though I do not answer any requests, so everything what I call will fail, um, obviously, but the application runs and does not go into a timeout. So if I refresh another page I use, that still works. So that's basically a very short demo to show um, that with every time when you call another services, outside your JVM, be very careful about things like timeout. Um, when there is a network, there is every time some way of setting a timeout here. So this is the example of a simple HTTP timeout. Obviously, there are better solutions. I promised in my abstract to show uh, more things than that. Um, what I'm going to show next is how to use patterns. Um, so there is a pretty uh, decent book called Release It. And this book, Release It, is not about releasing software in the sense of I use Maven or I use Gradle or whatever. Um, the book is about patterns to run your application. So there are different patterns like stability, capacity, um, transparency. And those patterns are especially powerful if you can use that as an application developer. And one thing how you can basically use those patterns in an implemented way is by using the Netflix stack. Netflix, um, I think it's known to everybody. Um, the most uh, critical KPI, what they have is they own 37% of the internet traffic of the United States. So they have some credibility of running uh, very high volume applications. Netflix created or implemented those patterns in their open source stack called Netflix OSS, which you can um, see at GitHub. And uh, this Netflix stack has been used by different application platforms, for instance, Spring. And uh, the demos I'm going to show right now will be based on Spring Cloud, which you can see on the top right corner. 
um, Spring Cloud is an application that basically implements parents for distributed programming. Um, don't get confused by the name of Spring Cloud because that was kind of a default because there was no better name available. Um, Spring Cloud basically does two things. The first one is to implement distributed patterns like service registries, circuit breakers, metrics. And the second one is to provide APIs to access cloud environments more easily. What I'm going to talk right now, I'm running that on my machine, so there is no need to use cloud computing at all. Spring Cloud itself runs on Spring Boot. Um, so with Spring Boot, basically the general idea is I can just start an application and uh, everything is included inside that application that I need. So it's the vice versa way of the typical Java E application. So Tomcat is embedded. So let's start with the first pattern. The first pattern is a circuit breaker. Um, circuit breaker is obviously like it means in real life, uh, you have a circuit, and if the circuit is closed, um, the request go through, and if the circuit opens, uh, the request will not go through. This is basically to protect your application from exhausting the threat pool, and uh, to protect the other application from basically uh, hitting it the whole time uh, without any uh, any need to because the service might not be available. And this circuit breaker, the general idea is you execute a command and this executed command is a timed command. That basically means it is only allowed a certain amount of time, by default one second, to execute. And if the command fails because it did not execute or it throw an exception, then a fallback is called if there is any or basically the command is returned with an error. And this is basically the way how you can protect yourself if you don't want to go into each API and find out where to set a timeout. So coming back to uh, my application, uh, basically, I now the application recovered. Um, so I can go back to my code. And uh, instead of setting all this stuff here, so let's say I forget to set the timeout because probably I have an API where a timeout is not able to be set. This can happen on external APIs which you use, so third-party APIs where you don't have exact control over the transport protocol. Um, what we can do here is basically um, Netflix, uh, Netflix provides an add hysterics command uh, annotation that basically means execute this command uh, in a timed way so to speak. So allow this command by default one second to execute. And if this command does not return, then just stop the execution. I will show that there are different ways to use a special threat pool or a semaphore for that. But the general idea is that this command will never execute longer than one second, regardless what happens inside those methods. So if I restart the application now, Take some time. And if I now execute one of the requests in my browser, you will see an exception message, exchange money timed out and fallback failed. So that basically means the call that I tried to do um, took too much time, so it fails. The nice thing here is basically that um, my application will give immediately feedback um, so my server will not crash um, because um, Hystrix will automatically terminate the stuff. So you see here I had um, I had thousand failures obviously, but my application is still responsive. And this is the major goal that people uh, on a distributed environment that you do not want to have cascading failures. So one failure kills all the other uh, things that you have. So this is on the on the circuit breaker. Um, the circuit breaker itself is a bit smarter than only um, re uh, executing a timed command. Um, the circuit breaker itself is, if you use it, like I've shown in the demo, you annotate the methods. And if you use Spring Cloud in some part of your application, you need just to add a add Spring Cloud application annotation, and then you can basically use that feature. What we see here, you also have a fallback method. So the fallback method is called. Um, this is a common pattern. So whenever you call external services, think about if an empty result might make sense. So in case of a search gateway, you might think of, well, can I just return an empty result, which is way better than returning an exception, obviously. So how does um, the circuit breaker 
uh, work, um, the circuit breaker itself has a monitoring feature and it has different KPIs. Um, so the circuit breaker can be uh, closed or open. Um, the circuit breaker can show how many requests went through, how many requests are in an error state. And this is what I'm going to show right now. There is a console you can call. So this console basically shows different um, KPIs. And if I call my load test, um, oh, just a second. So if I call my load test, then you see that the KPIs basically goes up. So unfortunately, there was no successful request because everyone timed out. Um, so the timeout requests are here. You see that the circuit is open. And what you see as well um, is, hmm, currently not, uh, what you see as well is a thread pool. The thread pool is basically one second pattern. So one thing is the circuit breaker. Um, the other thing is uh, the thread pool. And the thread pool itself, the, so that Hisrix uses an own thread pool um, to protect your Tomcat thread pool. So this is the typical case I've shown. You have multiple threads. If one service fails, um, the other will basically eat up your thread pool on the Tomcat. And what uh, Hystrix does by default, it uses the so-called bulkhead pattern. That basically means each Hystrix command that you have is executed by default in an own thread pool. Um, so those thread pools are constrained. Um, they should be in total, all the threads combined should be less than your Tomcat thread pool, obviously. But the good thing is that in the worst case, if your thread pool by default is 20, um, 20 threads or 20 commands might be stuck. Every hour, other ones are not stuck because the requests to that are re refused immediately if the thread pool is full. Um, this is quite convenient. There are other ways to use that is with a semaphore, so it's executed on the same thread, but the uh, amount of parallel thread is limited. Um, the default is uh, own threads in their own thread pool. Um, so you can see here as an example, if you execute your application, um, you are outside in command. You typically have a Tomcat thread, uh, which is here marked by HTTP Neo Auto One exec, which is the first thread of the uh, of the thread pool. And then you have the Hystrix REST Currency Exchange 10, which is the tenth thread inside your uh, command thread pool. So that gives you a kind of isolation, but that also gives you downsides. Obviously, uh, if you have an own thread pool, then you have to be careful about thread locals. So good advice is if you use Hystrix, don't use it in a very fine-grained manner. So don't use every method and add Hystrix command, but just use uh, add Hystrix command on your service layer. So before opening the transaction, before establishing your security context. And below that, you should not use a Hystrix command. If you use that below that, um, then you should use a semaphore Hystrix command to avoid dealing with threat locals. Because otherwise, you might end up in situations like you start a transaction, then you execute a command, and that you might start another transaction if the transaction management is threat bound, which is the case for Spring and most of the Java EE uh, servers. So, uh, going further, um, having a good timeout and a stable access to the external service is nice, but what you need as well is a kind of service registry so that you can replace services. So normally you have a one-to-one -one binding, so you call a service by an URL. The idea of a service registry is that you can replace services in the back, and your service does not know where the service itself, which he calls, is placed physically. So the service registry gives back services. Um, there are different implementations outside to be used as a service registry, especially in Spring Cloud. Um, the, there is Netflix, which the name is Eureka. There is Console and Zookeeper. Um, basically, the implementation which you should use depends on the um, cap theorem, what's important for you. So there are service registries like Eureka, which are very good in partitioning and availability, so being available basically throughout multiple data centers, but Eureka does not have any strict consistency rules. So if you remove a service, it might even be the case that for a few seconds, the service is still there. If you register a service, the service might pop off only after a few seconds. There is console and Zookeeper, which have more, uh, let's say, priority on consistency and availability, 
um, to make sure that once you register a service, it's immediately visible, but they do not have such a good availability and partitioning like Eureka. So using a service registry is good in a distributed environment. Which one to use basically depends on your requirements. Um, one is basically about um, the consistency rules, and the other one is how you use the service registry, because that is basically discovery. So discovery means how can I ask the service registry and use those. There are different patterns out there, how to work, and uh, it depends on how they're implemented. Um, there is one way which, uh, for instance, uh, is a DNS. So you install some piece of software on your server or on your node, and uh, basically you make regular DNS calls, and those DNS calls are basically then um, routed to the service instance. For instance, console works in this way, Kubernetes works in that way, um, so that basically means you need some client, some client on your application installed that fakes your DNS server, and the good thing is your client application does not know anything about a service registry. It just calls uh, myservice.somefakedomain.com, and then the service is basically routed to the real service instance. Um, the downside of it, this is you need some kind of infrastructure on your server. So you need to install a client, an agent, or whatever. Um, the other way is to use a service registry with a discovery client. Um, this is the way how Eureka works. Um, the disadvantage, so to speak, is that you have to use a Java API in order to, to discover the services. The advantages is obviously you don't need to install anything on your machine. So there is no need to change your DNS server, there's no need to install any agent, what console, for instance, uses. Um, you can just right away go with your client, make a call to a service registry, and then basically call the service instance. Um, what we see here is basically also you can load balance uh, the services that you call. So talking about my demo, I have a service registry in behind as well, uh, which is uh, Eureka. So Eureka is the uh, Netflix implementation. And what you can see here, I have registered my services by logical names. And what we see here, I can use the service. So I can say, give me a service instance of the currency exchange service, what we see here. And I want to call that. So this is basically the pattern that you're going to use. So you will get one of the service instances uh, which is available. So currently I have only one service instance which is available. I could start many of them and then I will see different numbers here so I can have many service instances. Um, the other way is if you want to use, if you have high level APIs, you can avoid that in total. You can just inject here um, a REST template and you can say I want a load balanced one. And then basically you don't need to call this one here. And so we can throw away this as well. Um, you just put in, this is by convention by Spring Cloud, um, you can just put in the service name instead of um, putting the host name and the port. So what happens um, while calling the service is basically this service name is translated uh, into the host name and port, which I call. So before doing that, um, I'm going to shut down my slow server and start the real one so that I can better show um, the demo. So let's remove this. Let's start this. And my price service. Okay, so now if I go back here, I see that my services are back again. And now I can execute my load test. So I can go to the Hystrix monitor. So you see uh, my requests are going through. Um, you see the, um, yeah, the requests went through. I have a lot of failures. This is because I only allow 20 threads here in the thread pool at the same time. And if I just go with more threads than the pool, uh, 10 threads at the same time, and all the other ones are just rejected. This also protects the other server. 
Um, so as you can see here, I just do a regular call and the REST template itself converts everything and calls the right um, service. This uh, REST template, what we see here, um, basically uses the Eureka discovery client and gets the service instance. There are other ways. If you are not in a Java space, for instance with Eureka, um, you can use um, a sidecar, which is called Prana on the Netflix way. This is also a pattern. So if you are running other languages than your, let's say, cloud infrastructure, in the sense of uh, Netflix, it's their Eureka server, you can use a sidecar. This is also a known pattern um, that basically means you can access the API of Eureka through a proxy. Or what you can use itself is a so-called edge gateway. So if you have, for instance, a front-end application running on JavaScript, um, you can then basically just call the services by using Zool, um, so without any need for um, a Java call or whatever. So load balancing is the next one. Um, if you have a service registry, it's quite useful to do load balancing, obviously. So load balancing can happen on different ways. The simplest way is you do a round robin. So round robin basically means you just call one after the other one. Um, there is a possibility of availability filtering. Um, load balancer clients like Netflix Ribbon, they implement that. So that basically means once a service is not available, it's just marked as offline and not tried anytime. Uh, or there's a way of weighted response time, which is especially useful um, if you basically have different data centers and you want to make sure that the fastest service is called. So the other pattern is, um, service service to communication, but if you have external clients, how to work with that? Um, I've seen projects and also implemented on myself, obviously, which did too many fine-grained calls. So they introduced 40 microservices and then they had some front-end application on JavaScript or whatever, and to load one page, it had to call, I don't know, 10 or 20 microservices. One way to avoid that is to start using an API gateway. The API gateway will reduce the chattiness of your application and also allow to do, let's say, more coarse-grained uh, calls to your application. So API gateways basically means instead of calling every microservice on yourself, you just call an API gateway, and those API gateway will basically collect the data and produce one big JSON that will increase uh, the performance because uh, basically the low latency performance on the left side is moved to the, uh, the high latency performance on the left side is moved to the low latency performance on the right side. So these are different patterns, but um, the second part of my talk is basically how you run those distributed architectures. So we have seen a few patterns that helps you to make the application more robust, um, but typically you do load test, performance test, stress test, and then you anticipate that everything goes fine. Um, this is basically a problem which even big companies had. So you harden your application, but you are still expecting that nothing bad happens. Um, but this is where we come to the to the anti-fragile part. Um, Netflix is a very good example. Together with Amazon, um, they failed in um, uh, 2009, I think. They failed miserably at Christmas. So everything was down for them um, because they did not have any patterns to support anti-fragile architectures. Um, Anti-fragile architectures are basically architectures where you inject failure. And this is what happened on Christmas, some Christmas, and I think 2010 or 2009. Um, basically, network traffic stopped on a few load balancers, and then suddenly, everything started to crash. So Netflix was down. And this is called a black swan. So black swan is a theory um, that you don't expect these kind of failures. So you build your application and you think this will never happen. But things happen and this is what we should anticipate. So embrace the failure, think about what could happen and even for the things that you think they will not happen, um, basically make preparations for that. And the idea is to write anti-fragile architectures. Um, anti-fragile is different than resilient or robust architectures. A resilient or robust architecture essentially means you build an architecture and it's so strong to basically stay online. Um, that works pretty well. So if you build an application that can handle one million users, 
if one million users come, you have a robust application. If you build it to handle, if the application gets 1.2 million and your application does not fail, then it's still robust. But uh, most of the time you forget other things like what happens if the network fails, what happens if the server fails, and this is where anti-fragile comes into the game. Um, Anti-fragile means basically the shocks makes your application better the whole time. And this is what happened basically on Netflix last year actually, um, on October, um, no failure. So they switched to an anti-fragile architecture, to a failure, um, uh, failure inject testing based architecture, and that basically means um, even though a uh, data center of Amazon went down, um, almost nobody um, recognized that Netflix is down because in the last few years they introduced a few techniques I'm going to show right now to make the applications more stable. Um, so um, the application of Netflix and uh, other cloud applications, they're just designed um, to fail actually. So that means failure is something you want to have every day, each and every day. And this is what you can do on yourself. So this is a lot of people don't do. Um, you can start and do it while testing. Um, there are good tools available on a default Linux box. So um, you can start, for instance, if you do a network-to-network -network communication, just add, um, there is a tool called Netem. You can just install it on each Linux. And you can start to add latency. Um, this is something we are likely not testing anytime. So we do not test what happens if two servers which communicates to each other, somehow the network in between gets slow. So you can inject those failures. Um, if you are a beginner, you should do it in your test environment. If you are a pro and have uh, tested that, you can do it in production. And this is what Netflix does. If you have, for instance, 50 server in service instances, you can just inject two failures to one and see if the other 40 ones are used correctly by the client and the whole platform does not crash. You can corrupt packages, you can drop packages, you can also block the whole DNS. So you can check if your application still works without a DNS uh, server available. So this is everything around networking to test the first uh, patterns we have seen. You can go even further and uh, simulate heavy I.O. So you can just, uh, this is something what can happen, especially in the cloud environment, because their storage is not guaranteed. So it's, uh, um, storage is not persistent in the first way. It's most of the time it's transient. Um, storage, the, the performance of the hard drive might be different based on the setup that you used. And you can simulate heavy, uh, heavy I.O. So just write, write on the disk and see if the application still performs, or you can burn CPU. And these are techniques you can start to add on yourself. Um, like I said, if you begin with, you should do it only in your test environment, not in production. But the general idea of that is that if you do that continuously, um, you can be sure that your application will survive failures. And this is what makes an architecture anti-fragile, making it stronger by injecting failures. Netflix has a complete series of monkeys. So they call it the Simeon Army. Um, the Simeon Army basically is a tool set. Um, so there is a Chaos Gorilla. A Chaos Gorilla is designed for Amazon, unfortunately, so it's not available for other cloud platforms. But if you run with that, the Chaos Gorilla, the first thing what he does, and likely the only thing, it just goes through and kills a few server instances in your application. So because the idea is if you have a, uh, redundant application, um, killing one server will basically not kill your whole platform. And this is what you can do with uh, Chaos Gorilla. Or there are other monkeys, for instance, a latency monkey, so that you can add latency automatically. So what we have seen on the last slide, executing Linux commands, can be done with a tool, uh, which is called the CMN Army of Netflix, to basically yeah, produce failure and uh, to make your application more resilient and more robust. Um, just to give an example, if you use or if you are going into the way of anti-fragile architectures, um, AWS reboot, this is what happens on cloud platforms. If there is some need um, for, to introduce security patches, so this has been done last year, Amazon needed to reboot a lot of servers because of a security issue on the hypervisor they used below. So they had to restart uh, a lot of EC2 instances, and I also got a mail like, your instances will be restarted and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Netflix survived uh, restart 
of 280 nodes for the Cassandra database, and 22 were dead, so they did not come up again. But this only works because they continuously kill Cassandra nodes in production, um, so that they can basically uh, make sure that even a failure of one Cassandra node does not kill um, your whole application. So, ending up, creating an anti-fragile architecture basically means also creating an anti-fragile organization. Um, this is what's important, for my opinion, is that you stop thinking that I have a jar file or a war file or whatever, and I just put it to the uh, ops people, and then somehow it will run. Um, basically, creating anti-fragile organization means you think also about what can happen while running the application and what can I do as a software developer to basically avoid uh, failure and to embrace failure because it's easy to shout on the hardware people, but hardware will fail and it will fail quite often. Um, but if you embrace failure in your software, then it's very likely that you're going to not be hidden by uh, any big outage in your application. All right, so I'm uh, done with my talk. I think we still have time left for questions. Just to go on the side because the spot... So, any questions on distributed architectures, anti-fragile ones? Who is using microservices? Let me raise a question. Who failed? No hands on, okay. I, th I think there is a question, yeah. Um, while also looking up at those technologies, I've often seen those fallback methods you can use when an actual service fails or if you have a timeout. Yep. And I've only seen like stupid response, uh, response like return 42, return empty list. Um, what do you do if you really require the result on the client? Yeah. What is the fallback then? Okay, so there are different approaches, obviously. Um, so the first one is um, you try to load balance. So what you can do, for instance, with a load balancer like Ribbon, you can say, go to the other data center. So if my data center, the service failed for some reason, just go to the other one, even if it's way slower. Um, the other thing is you might call a slower legacy system. So if you have two systems and the first one does not work, you might call some legacy system, uh, which might be slower, which might probably not get the exact same result, but which might be still doable. Um, you can cascade these fallback methods, so you can call uh, a Hystrix command, do a fallback method. Inside those fallback, you can still call another command and do a fallback again. So you can cascade those stuff and make a kind of a chain um, to try to get the result. Um, but there are not that many possibilities. I mean, you can try another system, um, you can try to get some cache data, which might be a bit of outdated, but still good enough. Um, you might be able to compute some result, um, but that's the general rule. So if, if you want to go use, a, use the same service, a different instance, I would try or I would rely on the load balancing part and just load balance to another data center or whatever. Um, if you are, want to program the way to get the fallback, then you need to think about how to get the value. But like I said, for the fallbacks, you can cascade them like you wish. Yeah. So any other questions? Okay, so then if there are no questions, uh, then thanks for listening and uh, have a great day.